John, thank you so much for being here today. I really um, value your time. And, and today um, we're going to be talking about legacy planning and leadership. Uh, Dr. John Townsend is a business consultant, leadership coach, psychologist, New York Times bestseller. You have 33 books. You sold over 10 million books. Uh, you have a, a book coming out that I'd like to talk about. Uh, you also are uh, nationally syndicated in a, uh, with a talk show in 180 markets and, and uh, 3 million people. And you lead the uh, Townsend Leadership Program and the Townsend Institute for Leadership and Counseling. And um, I just wondered if why you haven't done more things. Yeah, I'm kind of a slow starter, but one day I want to find my, my, my role. <laughs> So thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Uh, we're, as I said, we're going to be talking about legacy planning and in leadership, uh, something that you know very well, um, having worked with some of the top uh, wealthy people uh, in the world. And um, as you know, $60 trillion will be transferring hands uh, by 2060. And so um, there's a lot of work for um, for us to do in, in putting together the um, legacy planning for our our, our, uh, our clients. Uh, we have a, a process called Concerto, and it has four kind of components to it. It has uh, the uh, family legacy planning. It has the uh, wealth planning that has everything in there, like wealth, uh, like, like investments and tax, the estate planning and those types of things. Business legacy planning is another component, and then there's the philanthropic uh, legacy planning and all those uh, are interdependent, although they they can stand independently and they all act together. So, um, with that, I I would just like to you know kind of hear your thoughts on on the subject and and um, you know how you help families through that process. Sure. Um, yeah, families are always concerned about how do we not only preserve our wealth but also enhance it and grow it. Mm -hmm. And so I have a model when I work with them of kind of think about two strands. And one strand is the assets and the resource, whether that's companies or whether that's foundations mm -hmm. or a philanthropic organization or trust or whatever, and making sure that that's intact and, 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 and you know, structured right. Mm -hmm. And that's the money financial resource strand. But the other strand is the communication strand mm -hmm. because I've seen so often that if there's not good communication between board member and board member or husband and wife or a grandfather or grandmother or between generations as well, between generation one or two or three or four, mm -hmm. everything can get stuck. You know, I'm a, I'm a real fan of uh, Peter Drucker. The, they call him the Moses of management. Mm -hmm. He has a great statement about this. He, he says that culture will eat strategy for breakfast. Meaning, you have the greatest structure and setup in, in the world, but if you don't pay attention to the culture, which is the relationships, basically how do people connect and communicate right, right or wrong, that will really sort of um, slow down the process over here. So I try to work on both strands with the family. John, you're such a master at relationships. Can you give us a couple thoughts on on, on uh, relationships and how you manage that with a with a wealthy family? Yeah, that that communication strand that we mm -hmm. always have to be mm -hmm. be aware of. Well, I do a lot of work with um, with with um, families on um, first. I just kind of give them teaching. I mean, you got to give them information. There's a lot of great research. I, I'm a big mm -hmm. neuroscience studier, and there's so much information coming out in neuroscience about what makes a great relationship. Mm -hmm. um, we learn so much about how the brain relates well. And then we have these conversations where you solve problems and where you mm -hmm. encourage each other. And one of the things I I, I work with on families is kind of four different skills in the conversations because sometimes with families, suppose it's a mill millennial talking to a granddad or a grandmother and mm -hmm. it's like they just don't think the same way, they don't have the same worlds. But how do you talk about resources and legacy and foundations and all that? Mm -hmm. How do you talk about that? Because they can be kind of awkward talks or different difficult talks. There's kind of four ground rules I'll train a family in as we get together for those important talks. Mm -hmm. The first one is you be vulnerable. Vulnerability means um, being open about um, your struggles and um, that you're not perfect and that you have your own weaknesses too. People don't like to do that sometimes, but I can't tell you how great a job it does in disarming the other person. Sort of like you're not coming on like Superman or Wonder Woman. You're saying, you know, I'm, I'm just a person too. And the other person sort of like they relax and the communication gets better. Mm -hmm. The second one is to be able to listen. Now, vulnerability is me talking about myself, that I'm not perfect. But the second one 
is um, how do I reach into the other person's world and let them know I understand them? Now, as a psychologist, we, we call that attunement. How do I tune into that person? Mm-hmm. I have a phrase in my book I call getting in their well. Everybody's got a well inside them where you got to let them know, I understand what your struggles are and what your passions are and all that. So you learn to listen well. So now mm-hmm. you've got vulnerability mm-hmm. for about you. You've got listening well to about them. But that's not everything that an important conversation has. There's two more aspects. One is to be able to say the truth well. You've got to say, here's what I think is going on. Here's where I agree, disagree. But there's a respectful and kind way to be very direct about issues. And that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a skill everybody has to learn. And then the fourth one is to be able to listen to people's reality and truth to be able to hear feedback, maybe things you don't agree with without reacting and triggering and getting upset and walking out of the room. How do you hear it and go, um, that was really interesting that you said that about me and the way I'm thinking relating. I want to hear more about that. But if you've got those four things going, the conversations about this side of, of the table go very, very well. Mm-hmm. I can see how that works. Uh, I also am thinking about some clients that we have and and that must be very hard for them to maybe show some vulnerabilities because they've never had to do that or, or that's showing weakness in their mind. Or maybe um, they haven't had to do it or maybe they never got to do it. Some people yeah. in their own families, vulnerability wasn't part of the, of the Sunday night dinner table mm-hmm. where you're just talking about life, so they never mm-hmm. saw it modeled. So it's kind of a new, a new language for them. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of our clients want to pass on legacy, and so they're they're desperately searching for how to do that. And and their their uh, children and grandchildren want to get that information. They they're longing for it. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of questions that our clients will have is, um, you know, how do I uh, prepare my uh, next generation for my wealth? Um, how much do I give them? When do mm-hmm. I give them? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those types of things. Do you have any perspectives on, on how you've seen other families do that? Well, for one thing, a firm like your own is mm-hmm. really at the top of the game and sort of the what are the actual numbers and strategies because you guys have worked out great formulas about that. Mm-hmm. And so when people say, well, how much and when, and you, you guys know the structures, you know mm-hmm. the vehicles and that sort of thing. And so I always tell families, don't do this alone. There are people who have done this hundreds of times with, with families like your own. Make sure you've got somebody like you. Mm-hmm. But then there's the conversations about that. And what I've found is that it makes a, it's just like in a business where, you know, a CEO is trying to say, we're doing a new initiative. We're going to go international. We're going to go to Asia. Before you get all excited about that, you've got to get your key people in and get their buy-in. Why is it important to them? Mm-hmm. And so maybe generation one has got to say to two or two has got to say to three or whatever. Um, here's what I'm thinking about, but I really want your input in how we're going to transfer this in the right way that's respectful. Now, you got to do your homework first mm-hmm. because you're making the final decision. But all of a sudden, when they feel listened to, like their input is important, like their life is important, and what they feel is important is different than you, and that's okay, mm-hmm. the conversation goes better. There's a really big uh, kind of a, um, a principle I use with families about this is, and you've heard it before, is don't sweat the small stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a difference between you know somebody that says, well, um, we don't really see saving quite the way you do and this sort of thing. Well, those are tough conversations. But make sure you're staying with the big things. Like we have this responsibility. Will you call it a stewardship? We have this stewardship. How do we best use it for our family and our employees in the world? And as long as it's in the big picture and you don't get way too micromanaging, you're okay. Don't get stuck on the little stuff, though. Hmm, that sounds great. Um, I uh, love some of your books, and I, I just want to uh, kind of – read some of them because the in the title uh, talks about your your expertise and and your life balance perspective and uh, the entitlement cure finding success at work and in relationships in a shortcut world uh, leading from the gut raising great kids 21 days to a a great marriage Um, I I love all of that because uh, life balance is an important part of our strategic planning and uh, for for our um, our families. Uh, in the entitlement cure, what, um, what's something that you'd like to highlight from the entitlement cure? Well, I have these principles. And, and by mm-hmm. the way, i got to make sure I say this when I talk about that book. Um, I'm not talking about any demographic or any generation. Mm-hmm. You know, this, I'm not bashing any generation. I'll tell you why. 
my wife and our kids are out there and they're millennials and they're doing great and, and, I, and I know they're friends and they are the hardest working, high ethic people you can ever imagine. And I also know some 85 year old people who are sort of a nightmare. <laughs> so we're talking about everybody's got a little bit of this, you know, this virus here. But one of the things I think that's important in curing entitlement, the, the idea that I'm so special that I don't need to adhere to the rules of life, is to let people know um, get rid of the word um, I deserve mm -hmm. and use the word this is my responsibility. Mm -hmm. I deserve a house. Okay, we all like that, but it's my responsibility to do what I need to do to get a house. I deserve a great marriage, right, but what's my job to be a great husband or a great wife? So I kind of changed because neuroscience talks about as you, as you talk differently, your brain thinks differently. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of don't use the word deserve very much. I know we all deserve a break today. We go to McDonald's. <laughs> but don't say, I deserve all these things in my life. You have to work for things. And that begins to change the entitlement. Mm -hmm. on, a, on a side note, McDonald's is one of our, our uh, better dividend equity growing uh, stocks in our I'm portfolio. I'm a big believer. You do deserve a break today. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a new book coming out called People Fuel. And I absolutely love the title. Mm -hmm. um, and can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the book and why you wrote it? And, and well, it comes back to that other strand, I think, Don, mm -hmm. is um, that um, the way that the neuroscience says that we are designed is that we're, it's called attachment. We're basically very relational people. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times people, especially leadership people and people who are high platform people, high performing people, they kind of look at people as a drain. Like they wake up in the morning and think, well, I've got 2,000 employees, I gotta take care of them, and I got a family, I got mouths to feed. I've got people in my life who have needs. And so kind of the higher up you are in the world of platforming and success, the more you begin to see people as somebody who want or need something from you, and it's not a bad thing. People need us for various things. But people in that position often see relationships as sort of more drains than gains. And so I wrote the book to say, well, we've all got to give to the world, mm -hmm. but we've also got to have the gains in our life. So I have a model about how to relate to other people so that you get something too. For example, um, I use a medical uh, an analogy of, you know, bionutrients, right? We all have these supplements we take every day, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're in great shape. You take a lot of supplements, right? And, and so um, one of them is calcium. If I don't take enough calcium, I start to have bone problems. Or iron. If I don't take enough iron, I get blood problems, anemia. You've got to take these dosages of nutrients every day. On well, the same way as bionutrients, I have a model called relational nutrients, mm -hmm. where we're supposed to give and receive these to each other every day, and then we are healthy and happy. When you receive the right things from people that you need, then your brain works right, you're creative, you're energetic, you make great decisions, and you're focused. And so I have these 22 nutrients into four categories. And I'll just throw out a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. One of them I mentioned earlier, it's called attunement. Tuning into other people where they really are without, you, without giving them advice. Would you know that we need attunement too? You ever been around somebody and you really just wanted to kind of talk about how your day was kind of crummy and you don't want any answers and all they had was like, well, first thing you got to do is get up early. You know, you got to be disciplined or whatever. <laughs> well, I didn't need that. Just listen to me. That's attunement. It's mm -hmm. a good thing. Sometimes we just need somebody to encourage us. You know, I had a, I didn't hit a home run today and I feel bad about myself when somebody says, I know. But I think you're a winner. Well, that's like Prozac. I feel better. That's mm -hmm. another relational nutrient. Sometimes we need some truth. Like, can you give me some perspective, advice, wisdom, feedback? Give me something that I haven't thought about this before. And sometimes we need what I call a call to action, where somebody says, I think you need to do something. I'm going to give you some steps. Here's a path go. And if we are giving those things to each other and receiving those things to, uh, to each other, the people in our lives function better mm -hmm. and we function better. Yeah, I can understand the, the great synergy. It's a uh, great synergy. I was going to tease you and, and, and say I didn't hear you on what you said or, or didn't understand, <laughs> or uh, but I'll keep my humor um, out of it. I, I um, When you were, uh, you, you spoke at, at church at the beginning of the year, and, and, um, and we were talking about strategy and goal setting and all of that. And one of the things I really liked that you said was in uh, for every strategy that you have or every goal that you have, um, make sure that you write your why next to You've it. You've got to have the why. Yeah. And then I, the other part that I liked was um, always uh, tell an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are, those are uh, you know, 
two things that uh, were very valuable uh, to me. Um, I um, read this book a long time ago, um, which you know really well. Kuzes and Posner called the Leadership Challenge, and they came up with five characteristics of great leaders. Yeah. And it's research-based, too. They really did their homework. Yeah, and I, I thought it was really great, and I always remembered it. I kind of remember it by the acronym EMICE, because uh, the uh, E is uh, to um, enable, the M is to model the way, the um, I is inspire a shared vision, the C is challenge the process, and E is um, to encourage the heart. And, uh, and so I always remember it by that. Hmm. And, and I loved it because I've always, uh, you know, looked at leaders and, and kind of compared it to that model. And I um, um, also um, try to use it and try to, you know, we, we try to do that as partners and leader, leaders in this organization. Do you, what do you think of, um, you know, some guidance for, for leadership in, in business? Um, either uh, you know, for our clients or, or for people in general? Well, um, I have in my model um, that I teach at the Institute um, what was called the funnel, mm -hmm. that, that every organization is basically a funnel, but which means something from broad to very narrow. And just like Kusin and Posner talk about, you've got to start with vision. You know, what is the thing we're going to, you know, make a difference with? Are we selling paper clips? Is it IT? Is it medical services? And why is that exciting and different? And then what's the mission? You mm -hmm. know, and the mission is like who we are and all that. And then you've got to move down to what's your organizational structure. You know, so many great companies don't have a great structure, and they've got a lot of dotted lines of direct reporting instead of straight lines, so people get confused. So a great structure that makes sense with enough agility built in, and then you've got to go to, to culture. You know, what are your people? How do they relate? How do they, do they play well? Do they mm -hmm. connect with each other? Can they tell each other the truth? Do they trust each other? And then after that, your strategic plan. You've got to have the strategy. How do we get from point A mm -hmm. to point Z in a certain amount of time? What are the incremental parts of that? Mm -hmm. And what are the accountability execution parts to make sure it's monitored and followed? Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of how, you know, in the main, every great organization works. And so the leader is the person that lives by the funnel and knows this one isn't working right now. Let's boost this one up. Our strategy, we're kind of getting, you know, off, off focus here a bit, or we're not clear about our vision, and they take care of that. Mm -hmm. As you were talking, I was thinking about that's exactly our process uh, for mm -hmm. strategy planning and in, in our wealth management, where we we uh, become wise counsel to the family, and we help lead them through the the strategic planning process and mm -hmm. the you know put together performance indicators and continually improve that and. Um, so that's a great perspective. Yeah, you guys provide a metric so people know well something's really happening instead of well here's the great vision, but you know. It's like the, the, that New York Times bestseller, Grit. You've got to have the greatest passion in the world, but if there's not somebody making sure that things are done on a sort of mm -hmm. a incremental basis, things fall apart. That's, that's, I think, one of the strongest parts of you guys' firm. Mm -hmm. uh, have you worked with um, wealthy families? I know you have worked with wealthy families on, on governance. Um, is there anything that you'd, you'd share on just your experience with the different families that you've met on uh, structuring you know, family governance or governance over their um, private foundation or, or things along along those lines. Like some of the things that we put in place are, you know, obviously the communications and, and um, you know, the, some of the rules around it and the, those types of things. Right? Sure. The governance is huge. And there's always two, I don't know, let's call them um, um, factors that I think are really important to make it all work right. One is, is it going to be all family or family members plus outside experts? Mm -hmm. And it's an apples and oranges question, but you've got to determine, do we want to just be us that are here, those four, five, six family members, let's say, or is it, no, we need also other people for some reason. They've got some, they've got some expertise that we need, finances mm -hmm. or strategy or whatever. You just get to decide that part. The second thing you got to decide is, how do you figure out the difference between somebody who's on our board as a family, and somebody is also in direct operations in one of the entities or companies. Mm -hmm. Like, is so and so who's the who's the son of the, uh, perhaps of the of the patriarch and matriarch? But he wants to be on the board, but he also really likes running this company. So he's got to change hats 
in between mm-hmm. the two. And you've got to be able to have the conversations about when he says about his company on the board meeting, he's taken the company CEO hat off and now he's a board mm-hmm. member. He's got to work with them on, well, maybe that company's not doing as well as you think, and and um, we don't see it quite the same way. So you've got to have the ability to communicate about that. And, and um, I found that having really good, thorough conversations as you're crafting this is like magic. It works a lot better when you've had the conversations ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Um, on, on some of the families that you've met, uh, in terms of structuring the multi-generational kinds of um, um, structures, there's there's sort of the patriarch matriarch that that um, they control everything and it and it and it moves along generational lines, and then there's a, an independent structure where where maybe the um, the next generation wants to start their own vision, mission, and values. How, have you come across that, or do you have any thoughts on that? All the time. And again, that's an apples and oranges, because it's, it's legitimate for somebody to, who's grown up to say, you know, I have a different passion. Hopefully it's not something toxic or anything, but, you know, healthy passion, but it's a different area. So um, that's, again, a time to get some of those frank conversations out, where you either say, I want to extend what, what Generation One did in, in a different way, or I really do have a, have, have a different vision and mission for this. And Generation One has got to be able to say either that works with me and I still trust you, you know, mm-hmm. with the assets and the resources or to say, I'm not sure that, that works for me. And that's where you got to make sure you've got experts in there to, to do this. When this happens, it is not a a one size fits all process and it's not a um, it's not a one and done. You've got to have a series of meetings about this because so much is at stake. Mm-hmm. How much do we stay with the legacy? Or is there room to extend the legacy? There's room for everybody, kind of the Big Ten idea, or is it sort of like, no, it's not bad. It's really different, and we may have I have two parallel things, but it works really well when you've had the right conversations. Oh, great. Well, thank you for your time today. Um, I'm excited about your your book coming out June 25th. Is that when it's coming yes. out? June 25th. Uh, People Fuel. Um, thank you for what you do uh, in in uh, leadership and relationships here and and around the world and uh, in our community. And uh, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Don.